Hello, welcome everyone. Uh, I'm Sil Hunli in the linguistics uh, program and <coughs> I teach uh, phonetics and phonology mostly but also uh, do field methods and uh, yeah, something like that. <laughs> I also organize random events on campus and not so random but important events on campus and uh, this week uh, we have uh, uh, workshop on the publication process, uh, demystified, uh, demystified, and next week is actually more geared towards our undergraduate students who want to uh, go to graduate school in, the, in America. So if you know any undergraduate student who is interested in applying, or if you yourself want to have more information about that, please join. It's not just for undergraduate students, so anybody can join if you're interested. In so uh, without further ado, let me introduce uh, Professor uh, Andres Kutsi. <laughs> He's a professor at the University of Michigan uh, uh, in the linguistics department and he has uh, served as uh, editor of Language, uh, which is a journal of the Linguistic Society of America for six years from 2017 to 2022. And today at this workshop, he is going to share. Uh, his knowledge and uh, experience as being the uh, main editor of that uh, journal. Okay. I guess that's <laughs> that serves, and I will keep the mic. Thank yes. you. Yeah. So I'm going to remind you again. It's uh, five hours, right? Yes, yes, five hours, and <laughs> you cannot. You are not allowed to go home. <laughs> <laughs> one hour or fifty minutes? Uh, it's about. Uh, we have about one hour, okay. for, like or sixty-five minutes or something. Like that, but so um. I will sit so that I can see my screen better. I, I hope that's okay if you can't see me move. Um, thank you, Sung Moon, for organizing this. Also, thank you for the Japan ICU Foundation who contributes funding to fund some of my visit here at ICU, including for this presentation. Um, and thank you to all of you for coming to spend your lunch hour with us here today. So, yes, I'm going to talk about academic publication and it is true that I have experience with publishing from every angle of the process. As an author, I've been an academic for three decades and I've published 50 or 60 papers over the years. I've reviewed hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of papers over my career and then I was editor of this journal for six years, but in a sense, I have no more knowledge or experience with the publication process than the average professor, right? I mean, that's what we do in academia, we publish. Um, but, you know, maybe I have more experience than people who are starting out their academic careers. So the goal of today is just kind of take that process, how does journal publication work, what are all the steps, what happens behind the scenes once you've submitted a paper, to just kind of unpack that a little bit and make it a bit more legible to, to all of you. Um, it's a small enough group that you should feel free to interrupt me if you don't understand or you have a question, but I will also try to make sure not to use up the full hour to allow time at the end. But I'm a professor and that means I can talk non-stop for a very long time. I will, I will try not to do that. Okay, so that's the, the roadmap of what we're going to talk about today. Why do we publish? What's the place of publication in an academic career? And then we'll delve into you know, how does the process work. And I'm mostly focusing on journal publication. So pre-submission, pre what do you have to go through? How does the submission process work? Once you've submitted the paper, what happens behind the scenes with it at the journal? Um, what happens once you get a decision back? So just kind of talk through the process. To Try and unpack it a little bit. So let's begin with why do we publish, right? What's the place of publication in an academic career? And on the one hand, it's a very practical thing, right? We publish because if you're at the beginning of your career, you need to publish in order to get a job. If you are further along in your career, you need to publish in order to get promoted, right? So there's just this very utilitarian reason why we publish, it's to move up in the academic world. And that's a very important part of it. Right? I mean, that's, that's one of the main reasons why we do it. But I think it's important to remember that that's not the only and hopefully not the main reason that motivates us to publish. 
If you become an academic, it means you're kind of one of those people who are obsessed with research and obsessed with your area of research. And you're really dedicated to the promotion of science and the role of science in society. And I think that we should keep that in mind as one of the main reasons, probably hopefully the main reason, why we publish. It's to move science forward, to communicate our ideas to the broader scientific community and to the broader community out there, especially those of you in public policy and things like that. You really want to, your research to also re reach the actual policy makers. So I think it helps if we remember that you know one reason that we publish is because we care about science and we care about our field and not just to get a job or get promoted. Although that's certainly part of it, and it's certainly important. Um, a question that um, I often get and often ask myself is, why is the process to get published in an academic journal so arduous and difficult? Um, and, you know, and that's primarily because of the review process, and we will talk more about that later. And on the one hand, it is there in order to ensure the integrity of science, right? The process is difficult because we want to make sure that the things that do get published are actually good papers, trustworthy research. And we have to make sure that's the case because where our funding comes from, primarily from governments. And if we're going to publish junk science, governments are going to be even more reticent to fund the research, right? And also, if we think of our research as serving society, then we want to make sure that the research is actually good. So there's a reason why the process is so arduous, so complicated, and so difficult. Although I think there is probably also, to some extent, unnecessary gatekeeping. And sometimes really good research just doesn't make it into publication because of this arcane process that we have developed over the past century or so for academic publication. And there is a process kind of moving its way through academia now to try and address that, right? So creating more venues to share research, um, open access, kind of pre-publication sharing. So there's, there's movement to try and address that, that problem, but it is still really a part of, of the publication milieu in which we all function. So this is something that a colleague of mine at University of Michigan um, always say, she was our chair for many years, Professor Robin Queen, and she always says this when our new PhD students start, and it has helped me a lot over the last 20 years that I've been at University of Michigan, to think about publication as a conversation, right? It's just a very, very slow conversation. So if you're in a seminar, sit around the table with other people, you make a statement, you talk about your research, people around the table agree with you or don't agree with you, they tell you why they disagree, they ask you questions, you get to respond, you either agree with them and say, you're right, I changed my thinking, or you say, no, I don't agree with you and here is why not. So that's a, a conversation. Publication is in the real sense also a conversation. It's just a very, very slow conversation. When you submit a paper, that's your first conversational turn. So it's like you made a statement around a seminar table. It's just the response, which comes back from the reviewers, might take four months rather than 30 seconds to come back. But when you hear back from the reviewers, it helps to think about it as a conversation, right? It's like sitting around a seminar table. You make a statement, somebody says, I agree with this part, I don't agree with that part, and now you get to respond, right? So you can say, okay, I concede, there you were right, but there I don't agree with you, right? So I think it helps to, to think about it as a conversation, just as very convoluted, slow conversation. And it reduces, for me, some of the anxiety in the process, right? It's, it's a very convoluted way of having an extended conversation. Okay, um, so that's the big background, why we publish and how I think we should think about publication. Let's get into some of the more nitty gritty bits of how does the publication process actually works. And I'm going to talk you through the various stages from you're planning a submission to your paper has been accepted, right? What are all the steps that, that come there? 
So pre-submission stage, before you submit a paper. Um, one of the first questions you always have to make sure is, is your paper ready to be going to a journal? And um, that's a very difficult thing to decide, especially if you are early in your academic career and you haven't yet gone through the publication process many times, you haven't yet been asked to review many, many, many papers so you kind of know what a good journal article looks like. But here are just three things that I think helps to keep in mind. Um, and the first thing, the first two are really related. Right? A good term paper that you might write in a seminar class as an undergrad or even in grad school or a chapter from your dissertation, a good dissertation chapter, they may not necessarily be good journal articles. Right? Um, so why, why might that be the case and why do I think it's important that we think about it? So if you think about a term paper that you might write in a class in college or in graduate school, usually let's say the semester is 12 weeks long, you have four or five classes, so you write maybe three term papers that semester on a field you don't know very well and you typically write it like in the last four or five weeks of the semester. So when it's evaluated by your professor, the professor evaluates it given that context. And you might get, this is an excellent paper, A+. Plus. But what that means is, this is an excellent paper taking in consideration that it's a new field to you and you had like four weeks to work on it while you were also writing three other papers. Now, what happens, and it you know, happens to me, is you think, great, wonderful paper, let me submit it to a journal. And then you get very, very bad reviews back. Because when a journal article is evaluated, the assumption is not made you're new to the field and you've had four weeks to work on this topic. It's being evaluated under the assumption that you're an expert in this field and you have had as much time as is necessary to develop this project fully. So an excellent term paper might be a good start for a good journal article, but it's seldom already ready to go to a journal. And sometimes I think we as professors fail to communicate that successfully to students. Right? If you only get positive feedback throughout and now you submit that to a journal and you get negative feedback, it feels like, did my professor lie to me? They probably didn't lie, they maybe just didn't tell you the whole story. Right? Journal article, term paper, not quite the same thing. And the same for a dissertation or a dissertation chapter. So a dissertation chapter is often better developed than a term paper, but a dissertation chapter has a different goal than a journal article, right? When you write a dissertation, a thesis, you're trying to show your committee you know the literature, you know how to do research in your field, and you, you have an overview of the whole field. So, for instance, the literature review in a dissertation much, might be much longer and in depth than when you write a journal article, right? When you write a journal article, the assumption is you know the field. You don't have to show that by reviewing the whole literature. You review the part of the literature that's relevant to the specific topic you're addressing, right? So it's often a lot more focused than even a, a dissertation. So good journal articles, good dissertations are great starting points for making good journal articles, but there's probably still quite a bit of work necessary. And then, you know, in the same thing also, uh, the first draft is seldom ready for submission, right? When you write the first draft of an article, it often is kind of the route you took from the question to the answer. But as you do the research, you might take, you know, wrong turns, figure out you were wrong, turn around, go back, try a different turn. And when you first write a paper, you're kind of developing your thoughts and you might take all these false turns. And you get to the answer, and that's how you got there. But that's usually not a good journal article because you want to make it easier on the reader to go from the question to the answer than the process you went through, right? So write it out first, that's how you figure out the answer. Now you've written it out, now step back and ask, Okay, I took this route to get to the answer, but I have to write this route for the author, the reader, right? So, you, the first draft 
is the place where you organize your thoughts and then you revise and you rewrite and you get feedback. You go to conferences, you get feedback from your community, you ask your colleagues to read it. You ask your non-expert friend to read it. You know, that's often a very good way to, to make sure you don't have too much jargon in there. So first drafts, like term papers, usually need more work before you submit it to a journal. Okay, so um, <clears throat> what makes a good journal article? A little bit about that. You also, before you submit a, an article to a journal, need to make sure that you find the right journal, right? Every field has many, many, many journals. How do you find the right journal to submit your particular paper to? And one of the most important questions, but also the most difficult kind of to answer is, is my paper the right fit for this journal? Right? And fit is in quotation marks because it's such a difficult thing to define. But how might you determine that? Right? So read other papers that appeared in that journal and see what, what kinds of topics do they address, what style are they written in, uh, Look at the papers that you cite in your own paper. Are you citing a lot from that journal? That might be a good indication that your research is the type of research that would appear in that journal. Um, so that's kind of asking about the character of the journal. You also have to ask, what about the character of my own article? Right? So sometimes we write papers that are you kind know, of the culmination of a large research project where you're trying to make a big theoretical contribution to the field and that you might therefore aim for the kind of journal that do these big statement pieces, the top tier journal of the field for example. Sometimes along the way as you're working on a big project you have many more smaller projects that might be for instance, I'm thinking in linguistics now, more descriptive, more um, empirically oriented and you know then you might have to go for a journal that is more descriptive and empirically oriented if you submit it to a very theoretical journal even if it's really excellent research it might just not work right so you need to to objectively look at what is the nature of my paper and then go and investigate all the journals in your field and find which one is this the right for. Um, and if in doubt, you know, talk to your advisors. Um, you can even carefully reach out to an editor and say, here's the abstract of my article. I'm not exactly sure if your journal is appropriate. I say carefully because editors have way too much work to do. So only do that if it's like, I really want to publish in this journal and I think my paper is going to fit, but I'm not sure. So don't, you know, spam editors' inboxes with too many such messages. Okay, um, also I think it's important to ask when you are trying to find the journal to publish in, to submit to, is what do you want to achieve? Right, if you are on the job market or you're up for promotion, it might be really important to get published. Right, and then you, you might aim for a journal that you know you know, publishes 10 issues a year or has continuous publication and a faster time through the review process, maybe a slightly less high tier journal because the most important thing is you have to go on the job market, you know you need two or three publications, so you want to get the paper out. Um, or, you know, maybe you have an impact paper, so you are a little bit further in your career or, you know, it's kind of the the statement paper from your dissertation where you want to make your big theoretical contribution, then you might aim for a different kind of journal. Right? So you, you have to ask what's the nature of my research, what's the nature of the journal, what's the goal that I have with this paper. Right? So who do I want to talk to, what do I want this paper to do. Um, there isn't really a, a recipe you can follow. I mean, this is very much kind of a developing a feel for the field as you go too long along, but these are the kinds of things to, to think about. Okay, so you've identified the journal you want to submit to, you've made sure that your paper is probably ready for submission. Now, um, how do you prepare your manuscript for submission? Really important to follow the journal's instructions exactly. 
many journals, and I get annoyed by journals like that, but many journals, even for initial submissions, will have very strict requirements about formatting, double space or single space, you know, don't put your figures in the paper, but upload it as separate files. And um, I think it's better if journals at the beginning say, submit in whichever form you want to, and if we accept your paper, then we'll make you do all the work of formatting it. But many journals ask it right from the beginning. Look very carefully at what the journal is asking for and follow those instructions to the letter. It's annoying to the editorial team if they get a paper that doesn't follow the instructions and they have to spend even 15 minutes on rejecting the paper. It's annoying to you if your paper is rejected without being read because you didn't follow the submission instructions. So read the instructions. It is surprising how many academics don't read the instructions. Read the instructions. Follow them very, very carefully. Anonymization is an important one to look at. I mean, some journals require that you anonymize your paper. Um, and journals have often very different ideas of what they mean with anonymization, right? So make sure you, you follow what the journal specifically says. So some journals will want you to replace your own name everywhere with author, right? You will have something in author 2022, I argue that. Some journals say, don't do that. And would say, you know, just refer to yourself in the third person. So I would say, could see it 2022 argues that. I like the second better because, number one, now you can put the reference in the list of references so reviewers can see the reference. And number two, you know, if you say in author 2022, I argue that blah, 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 you can kind of reveal yourself to reviewers because often reviewers will figure out what paper you're referring to. But anyway, make sure you follow what the journal's instructions are. Make sure you also look at the metadata on the files, right? Both your PDF or Word documents or whatever often have your name in the metadata. So make sure you delete those things. Because journals will reject the paper or send it back to you if you didn't do that, right? So make sure you, you anonymize according to the journal's instructions. When you prepare the paper, appearance matters, right? We always say in life appearance doesn't matter, substance matters. It should be the case in research too that substance content is more important than appearance, but the reality is appearance does matter. So if your paper is poorly or inconsistently formatted, line spacing changes halfway through, your numbering system for sections is not consistent, you know, some of your figures have elaborate captions, others don't have elaborate captions, your tables are formatted differently. Um, it creates with reviewers the impression of carelessness, and they might therefore unintentionally also worry about did you take care with your research. Right? So make sure that by the time you submit it, it looks good, it's consistent in formatting. Um, make sure your tables all are formatted the same way. Your number numbering throughout is consistent. Make sure it looks professional. It shouldn't matter. And often, when you're a reviewer, journal you know journals will tell you, don't pay attention to the appearance. Pay attention to the substance of the paper. But reviewers are people, and they are influenced by things like that. It's also, you don't want to annoy a reviewer, and reviewers get annoyed if it's like, why did the font change here? Was it intentional? I mean, are they signaling something, and now you have to spend time to try and figure that out, and then you annoy the reviewer, and that might, in the end, come back to bite you. So, assume that you will spend a lot of time, once you're done writing the paper, formatting. That's part of the process. And then proofread, 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 and proofread. Again, reviewers shouldn't look for, are your commas in the right place, and did you make a typo, and did you make a grammatical mistake? And often journals will tell reviewers, don't look at that. There's a later stage of copy editing where those things can be fixed. But it does, it does affect reviewers. So, um, I don't think it's necessary that you necessarily get, say, a formal editor to read your paper for language correction, but um, you know, 
go through it and make sure there are no or at least very limited number of typos and grammatical mistakes and things like that. The more professional your paper can appear, the better. Although it shouldn't matter, it, it does. Okay, so you've determined your paper is okay, you found the right journal, you've gone through the lengthy process of getting the formatting correct. Now you are at the stage of you're ready to submit the paper. Um, so most journals nowadays have an online portal through which you log on, you create an account, and then you submit your paper through that portal. Um, some journals still use email attachments. I don't think there are any more journals that want you to send in a hard copy of your paper. That's what was happened 30 years ago when I started my career, is you submitted hard copies of your papers. So often if you submit to smaller journals run by, say, academic societies, they often don't have the resources to have their own website, and they, those might be the journals where you email the editor with an attachment of your submission. But most journals now have an online submission portal. Um, the online submission portals are not always necessarily better. They're sometimes painful to navigate and difficult to use. So um, you should assume that you might spend hours to submit your paper. Because often journals want you to upload, say, every image or table as a separate JPEG file. And then you might have to go and extract them from your paper, make them into JPEG files, and then spend hours uploading every file separately. Um, you know, just be prepared for that submission process. Is going to, might be easy or it might be difficult and it might take you a long time. And don't get annoyed, or if you get annoyed, get annoyed, but you can't get around it. It's the process, you know, so make peace with it. It's going to be frustrating sometimes. Um, we've already talked about make sure that you format the paper exactly as the journal tells you it should be formatted, because if you don't, it will probably be returned to you without having been read. So you've just made yourself and other people a lot of work if you didn't follow the instructions. Um, Often, you know, there will be specific requirements about file format. Should it be PDF? Is LaTeX allowed? Does it have to be a Word document? Are the images included in the paper or do they have to be separate files? Can they be Excel images or do they have to be JPEGs? You know, so there's sometimes a lot of work that's necessary to get the, the right file format. So, you know, allow yourself enough time. Um, some journals ask for a cover page, so this is often the case in journals that has an anonymous review and the cover page will be the one where you have the author's names and addresses and things like that. Um, some journals don't ask for that and you enter that information in the online portal. So, you know, again look at what, what they're asking you for. Um, you nearly always have an abstract in your paper itself, but sometimes journals also want you to upload that separately or stick it into a text box. The text box option, which is fairly common, is particularly annoying if you are doing linguistics and you have special characters, which often you can't use in these text boxes. So, you know, be prepared for these frustrations in the process. Many times journals ask you to also enter keywords. Those are really important because they help the editorial team often to find reviewers by using the keywords. Um, they're also used by, for instance, Google Scholar and things like that to index your paper. So your keywords are the things that people might be able to find your work with once it appears. Right? So it helps, it helps to take a few minutes to think what are the actual keywords that you want people to be able to find your paper for. Um, author statements are becoming a thing. Um, so what are author statements? Many journals, especially in fields where you have many authors on a specific article, is now asking you to submit an author statement and that will be for instance, authors A and B conceptualized the project, author C helped to design the experiment and author D collected the data, author A was primarily responsible for drafting the document and all authors read the document and gave feedback before it was submitted. Right? So many journals are now asking for this author statement to be included in the submission process. Um, a question that I often got when I was editor of the journal um, is 
should you submit a cover letter with your submission. I think it is never necessary and I have never seen a journal that requires a cover letter. It is also completely okay and acceptable to submit a cover letter. Right? And sometimes you can do it as a separate PDF document, sometimes in the submission portal there is a text box where you can kind of like add a note to the editor. So if you want to submit a cover letter, feel free to do so, it can be something fairly simple like, Dear Professor Hiramatsu, please accept here with my paper on topic X. Um, I appreciate your consideration of my research and theory. It's nice to do that, but it's not strictly necessary. I think it was more important back in the day when submissions were done either by email attachment or by hard copy, because now once you've registered in the, lab, in the journal portal, all your information is already in there, right? so it's, it's less important. But you can all, always do so. A question we also often get on the editorial team is, should I or can I suggest or unsuggest potential reviewers? Some journals will explicitly ask you to suggest potential reviewers. Many journals don't ask you. If a journal asks it, then you definitely should do so. If a journal doesn't ask, perfectly okay not to do it, perfectly okay to do it. The important thing if you do suggest potential reviewers is you have to do so strategically because the editorial team is never going to select reviewers only from the list that you provide. They might select some of those reviewers, but they will also go off list and invite other reviewers, right? To kind of make sure that you didn't bias the review pool. So it's good if you suggest reviewers. If there's a couple of people that you think are likely to give you a positive review and that are very obvious reviewers for your paper, not to mention them, so that the editorial team can ask them. Right? So you don't want to list everybody who would be a good reviewer for your paper. So be strategic, think about who are you going to mention and, and who not. Is it okay to unsuggest reviewers, right? To say, please don't ask the following people to review my paper. Um, it is okay, but it should be used only in truly exceptional and extreme circumstances. I think most academics will go through their whole career without having to do that. So it is not okay to say don't ask Professor X to review my paper if you know that person you know, is in a different theoretical framework or you know, has a different take on the phenomenon you're analyzing. That's a normal part of academic interaction, right? We, we disagree with each other all the time. So, so that's not an okay reason to ask don't ask this person to review my paper. It's okay if there's kind of something you're very unprofessional in your interaction with that individual or if that individual is just like truly contrarian and you know there's just no way that it would work out with that person but you should think very very hard and probably talk to your colleagues before you decide to add, to add a note to say don't ask this person to review the paper but it is sometimes perfectly legitimate to do that you should just kind of think carefully Okay, so you've gone through the whole submission process, now the paper is out of your hands and you're going to wait four to six months probably to hear anything back, what happens with your paper once you've hit submit. Um, let's first talk about the different kinds of review that we find. Double blind is the gold standard, it's still the most common review model, it's double blind in that you as the author do not know the identity of the reviewers and your manuscript is anonymous so the reviewers don't know who you are. The editorial team knows who everybody is but the reviewers and the authors don't know each other. The pros of that is that it is supposedly objective, right? If the reviewers don't know who you are, they evaluate your research and not what they know about you. The cons of this is reviewers are unaccountable. Right? because they can hide behind anonymity and sometimes that means they can be unnecessarily harsh. Um, but it is still the gold standard, the most common model, and I think in most cases it works well. It is becoming more common 
nowadays to have less blind models, right? So we have the single blind model, which in some subfields of linguistics is becoming fairly common. So single blind means you as the author are, the reviewers know who you are, so your paper is not anonymous. But you don't know who they are, so it's single blind. The author doesn't know, the reviewers know. And the thinking here is, in a small field, I'm thinking about my own field, if I submit a paper to a journal on the phonetics of Afrikaans, it doesn't matter how much I anonymize that paper. Every reviewer will know it's me. Right. So, especially in small fields, the double-blind part is, is kind of fake. So, or authors and you know, reviewers do this, and I, I don't think it's good practice, but reviewers do this. You get a paper, you immediately stick the title into Google, and you see if you can find the author. So the, the fact of the matter is double-blind is seldom double-blind, it's usually single-blind. Reviewers can very often figure out the identity of the author. So that's one reason why single-blind is becoming more common, right? It's kind of, let's just acknowledge the reality. Now the, the con of that is now bias might creep in more, right? Because a reviewer might know who you are and intentionally or unintentionally that might influence how they're going to evaluate your research or they might be evaluating you rather than your research then something that is newer and there are a few journals in my field linguistics that does this is the completely open review where everybody knows who everybody is um, and what that does is it makes the review process much more of a conversation right because you know who the reviewers are and often in those journals, the reviews themselves are also published together with the final paper so that the whole field can also kind of see the conversation that happened about the ideas. So the good thing about that is, is everything is out in the open. The reviewers know that they are identified to the whole field. So they are probably not going to be super nasty because they know they will be outed. It really makes it much more of a conversation. But then, you know, the cons of that is now reviewers might, because they know, everybody will know who they are, might be more hesitant to point out real flaws with the research. So none of these are perfect. Um, they're all different models of review and depending on which journal you use, you will be subjected to one of these models. Double blind is still the most common. The others are becoming more common. Okay, what is the structure of an editorial team at a journal? Um, it differs. So this is kind of a typical editorial team structure, but different journals will have different structures, but this is not very uncommon. So you have the editor at the top. That's the person who kind of oversees the whole process and also sets editorial policy for the journal, determines the, the character of the journal, you know, sets editorial direction for the journal, and then there's often an editorial assistant because running a journal is a big job with a lot of work. So this might be somebody that helps with the administrative tasks. This might be the person that you are in contact with during the submission process to answer questions about the portal or who might write back to you to say this file didn't upload correctly. So you might or might not engage with the editorial assistant. There's often, not all journals have them, but many journals have an editorial board. That's usually senior scholars in the field uh, who have a good standing in the field and they serve kind of an advisory role to the editor. So the editor might go to them in difficult cases like, I have reviews that are completely in conflict with each other and I don't know what to do in this case. And then you can ask your editorial board to give additional input to help you with that. But usually the editorial board is only kind of an honorary position and they don't do a lot of work. The most of the work is done by the associate editor, if you're in a journal with associate editors. Some journals don't have them, the editor does all the work in smaller journals. In bigger journals you have these associate editors. So these are people who might be specialists in subfields of the bigger field. And the editor will send the paper to the associate editor who knows that subfield better, who will get the reviewers solicited and kind of do the, the nitty-gritty work with moving your paper through the process. So that's kind of a typical structure of an editorial team, you know, with some variation between journals. 
what's the typical flow of the editorial process? So you submit a paper and the first person that paper goes to is the editor. And the editor will do a quick read of the paper or a detailed read of the paper depending on how much time they have and how interested they are in the topic. And then the editor might decide at this point to do what we call a desk reject. So to decline the paper without review. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about what might cause a desk reject. Or the editor can, after that first read, decide, you know what, I think this paper is interesting enough and probably good enough to enter the review process. And then we'll assign it to an appropriate associate editor that kind of is a specialist in that sub-discipline. And, you know, and this is now assuming you have this editorial structure, right? So it might be different if you don't have associate editors. So the editor sends it to an associate editor. The associate editor then usually finds reviewers because the associate editor is a specialist in the topic of the paper, so knows the field, that subdiscipline well. The reviewers would send their reviews back to the system and it goes to the associate editor. The associate editor will write a report or a recommendation that goes back to the editor. And based on all that input, the editor will issue a decision that then goes to you as the author. And most journals, that decision also goes to all of the reviewers. So the reviewers will see their own review, all the other reviews anonymized, plus the associate editor's report, plus the editor's decision. So they typically see the whole package of, of what happened. So that's the kind of typical flow. And then you might go through this flow more than one time, right? If you resubmit your paper, then it goes back to the editor again, and the editor can again take any of these decisions, right? So there's, you can go through the cycle multiple times. Okay, what are the possible decisions that you might get from a submission? Um, a desk reject, right? So we can talk about that in a moment. A revise and resubmit and accept the decline. So a desk reject. So this is when the editor decides, I'm not going to send this paper to the review process at all. I'm just going to decline it off-right. That is usually because the paper is just not a good fit for the journal, right? It's just like, this paper is about, you know, about literature and my paper is on linguistics. So sure, it's about language, but it's not a good fit topic-wise for my journal. So often, most often, it's a fit problem. It also happens that, you know, this is a good topic for this journal, but it's just underdeveloped, right? So the editor doesn't want to send the paper to the review process if the editor doesn't think that paper is likely to survive the review process. Because once it enters the review process, there's a lot of work that is being done by a lot of people, by the editorial team, by the reviewers, by you as the author, so we're trying to save labor by saying, and you might get a desk reject with the editor saying, this is a good topic and I can see there's the beginnings of a good paper here, but these are the things that I think are still lacking and therefore I don't think this paper is going to succeed. So I'm declining it, but I leave the door open, open for you to say resubmit it after, or not resubmit, submit it as a new paper after you've maybe done the additional so desk reject is something that happens um, to all of us, so you know, it happens. Um, revise and resubmit is kind of the decision you hope for after your initial submission. It's kind of the, the, the most likely positive decision that you'll get. And then revise and resubmit also comes in many different flavors and different journals call them different things, but major revisions is what you will typically get if it's the first round of re re revisions, right? You've submitted your paper the first time, it went out to reviewers, you get the report back, they ask you to revise it, and that will typically be a major revisions decision, which means substantive changes are going to be required of you. It's not just fixing typos. And you should be prepared to work two to four months or longer on that paper to get all the revisions made, right? So often there's a lot of work that's required at this point still. And usually when you resubmit it to the journal, it will go back to the reviewers, right? Because you made so many changes, they want the reviewers to look at it again. So it's often a difficult decision to get because they criticize so many things in your paper, but that's really a very, very positive decision. Editors will not issue a revise and resubmit decision if they do not believe your paper will likely be published. Right? Because they know it's a lot of work for you and many other people to make the revision. 
So that's really a very, it doesn't always feel like it, but it's a very positive this year. You can also get a minor revision, so that's more typical the case if your paper has already gone through one or two cycles of review and then minor revisions are mostly kind of just like clarify a few things and correct some formatting issues and usually that wouldn't go out to external review again, it will just be reviewed in-house by the editorial team. Um, very unlikely to get this on a first round. Not impossible, but very unlikely. It's usually after round number two or round number three that you get something. And then, of course, you can get the accept decision. Usually, the kind of first accept decision is accept pending revisions. That means we're okay with the paper now, but you still need to fix some formatting and minor clarifications. You submit it, editorial team does a quick review and make sure you, you make the changes. And then you will get the accept as is. Okay, congratulations, we've accepted your paper. The next time you'll hear from us is when you get proofs. This whole process can take six to 24 months from submission until acceptance. Because typically you submit a paper, going to wait four to six months to get the reviews back. Then you're going to work four to six months to make the revisions. Then you submit it again. The second round revisions are often faster because by now the reviewers know the paper, but it can take a long time. Just a process. Okay. You can also get a decline decision. These are very difficult decisions to issue for the editorial team, very difficult decisions for the author to receive, but they are a part of the process. Virtually all academics have declined decisions somewhere along the way in their careers. I say virtually all because I have a colleague at Michigan who has never had a decline review, a decline decision. I, in my 30 years career, have had four. I don't know if that's many or not, but you know, you get declined decisions are always very, very, very painful. What might be the reasons for this? Sometimes, you know, in a desk project we've already talked about, but sometimes you get a declined decision after the paper went out for review. And sometimes it's because the reviewers have just identified a fatal flaw. You misinterpreted a set of data. You, um, this is a, a critical piece of data that you didn't know about. Now we know it exists and your argument for that reason just doesn't work, right? So sometimes it's just a fatal flaw. The paper just can't work. And in that case, the paper is kind of dead, right? You made a mistake in analysis and the topic is just gone. Sometimes it is because, you know, get the reviews back and the reviewers are like, this is a great idea and I can see there's a good paper in here, but it is just very underdeveloped. And the revisions that would be required are so substantive that in effect you will have a different paper on the same topic rather than a different version of the paper. And in that case, editors will often decline the paper, but it will be a decline leaving the door open for go and rewrite the paper and then you might perhaps resubmit it here. Um, whatever the reason is, the decline decision is always very, very painful. Okay, I will skip through a few to make sure that I stick to the time. Um, let's look at, okay, you've now gotten the reviews back and they've asked you to make revisions, so how much time do we have? Okay. So, oh, yeah. perhaps a question? Sure, 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 sure. Yeah, okay. So, um, it's always hard to get reviews, right? And even positive reviews are going to be negative because they will criticize a lot what you've done. So it's good practice to read them, put them away for two weeks, and then come back to them, right? Um, I am going to get, okay, how do you tackle the, re the revisions? So now you've spent two weeks, you've kind of gotten over the initial upset. Then I think you go and you read through the reviews many times, multiple times, to try and understand what are the themes, what are the common patterns, what are the things that are easy to address, what are the substantive changes you have to make. So you start kind of annotating the reviews and plotting a plan for how are you going to tackle these revisions. Um, and then, you know, maybe do I need additional data? Do I need to run an extra experiment? So those will be the things you'll do first because they might determine what comes later. And then you create a plan and you sit down and now you write the revision. 
um, what are possible responses that you can have to review reviewers, right? You can agree with the reviewer and that's the basis. Like, you know what, you're right. I was wrong and your idea works better. I'm going to apply that to my paper. Thank you. Or you can disagree with the reviewer, right? And you can disagree with the reviewer because they misunderstood you, right? It's like they just didn't understand what I was trying to say and therefore their judgment is wrong. And the good response there is not, your reviewer should have read my paper better. A good response is, if the reviewer misunderstood me, readers might also misunderstand me. So I should go and find a better, clearer way to say it. You can also have a fundamental disagreement with the reviewer, which means you just don't agree with the reviewer. And that's okay. And it's okay because you don't have to do everything that reviewers ask of you. Right? No editor is going to expect that. It's a conversation, and sometimes in a conversation it's like, I agree with you on that, but there I don't, and this is why not. So you don't have to do everything. You have to do most of what the reviewers ask for, and the things you don't do, you have to engage with substantively and have a good explanation for why you're not going to address them. Okay, you're going to submit a cover letter together with your submission, your revision. And the cover letter, you're going to explain all the main changes that you've made, and then you also kind of want to go through your reviews and there's many ways in which you can do it but one way is like what you see it's very common we kind of take a snapshot of a section out of the review this is what is in boxes here and then below that this is how I address this here's the next comment from the reviewers this is how I address this and then you submit this to the journal and your revised paper plus your cover letter with all this information all of this goes back to the reviewers, right? So you should remember that your cover letter also goes to the reviewers, so you have to really engage with them. Um, okay, so now it goes back out for review potentially, and it goes through the whole cycle again, and then eventually your paper gets accepted, and I will run through this in 30 seconds because this is the part that is easy and fun. Um, you know, it's accepted, it goes out for copy editing. At some point, sometimes months later, you get the proofs back. Now you have to read through the proofs, make sure that they copied all your special symbols accurately, that they didn't mess up the formatting. And then, you know, the next thing you see is when your paper appears in print. Okay. Publication process, it's long, it's arduous, it's difficult, it's also one of the most positive parts of an academic career because it's our chance to tell other people about topics that we are passionate and excited about. So I think it's important that we also remember it's not just hard work and negative reviews, it's also one of the most positive parts of our job and especially when you get that message saying congratulations we've accepted your paper for publication there aren't many days like that in your academic career celebrate them do a little happy dance go out for a drink take off three days celebrate those highs they, they're difficult to get okay i think i'll stop here i've already gone longer than i had intended for which i apologize thank you Yeah. So uh, I will open the floor for question or an answer. The time for this was until 1:50, but uh, that, uh, uh, Professor Putier has a little bit more time. So uh, those who officially it will end around 1:50, but like after that, if you have real question, we will accept it. Is that okay? I, I'm happy to end around for 20, 30 minutes. Right, so right, right. You so, don't have to leave. You don't have to. Oh, anyone? Yes, just speak loud. Okay. okay, thank you for your uh, presentation. I have a question regarding um, how to write a response letter, especially when you have a fundamental disagreement with the reviewer. How, um, usually you can just write how you revise the paper and yeah. the comments, but how <coughs> can we do in this case? So, so you, you're not the reviewers ask you to make the change and you've decided not to make the change. How do you address that? Well, one thing you have to do is you have to address it. Right? You can't just hide it and not talk about it. Um, because 
uh, say, especially if it's a major revisions decision, it's likely to go back out to reviewers. Sometimes to only a subset of the original reviewers, sometimes to all of them. But it's particularly likely to be sent back to reviewers who were more critical on the first round. So the reviewers probably will see that you didn't address their comment. So that means you, if you are deciding not to do so, you have to talk about that in your cover letter. So how to do it? Um, respectfully. <laughs> so um, most academics, as is true of most people, are reasonable. So, and most academics know that we are having an intellectual conversation and that might mean differences of opinion. So, I mean, you can write back and say, thank you very much to reviewer two for the following comment. Um, I have thought deeply about it and based on the following reasons I have decided not to change my viewpoint and therefore not to incorporate this decision into my paper. And then you do a uh, you know, an uh, explanation for why I decided not to do it. Um, as I say, most people are reasonable and will understand that that's an okay response. Not everybody is reasonable, you know, so a reviewer might, in the second review, be upset because you didn't address their comment. Um, but most people accept that, and that's just kind of how it works. So. And that's why I think it's important to think about it as a conversation, right? It's like, I said something, you didn't agree, and I still believe what I said before, and this is why I think, you know, you were wrong. So, just address it head on and be respectful. Sometimes, if it is a very, very fundamental issue, where it's kind of like, it determines the character of your paper, and you are like, I just can't do this. Then it might be appropriate to write to the editor and say, this comment by reviewer number three, I see it's really important, but I don't think I can do it. And, you know, ask for advice from the editor. I would do that only in rare circumstances because the editorial team has a lot to do and you don't want to pepper them with 20 questions about your revision, kind of in, in really extreme cases, we can consider that. But in general, respectful, reasoned engagement with the reviews are received positively. What the editorial team is looking for, did you engage substantively with the reviews? And engage substantively might mean, yes I did, by incorporating the changes, and yes, I did by not incorporating the changes, and here is why I didn't. But I engaged with them, right? I took them seriously. I thought about them. I considered them. And even so, I decided not to do it. Usually that works. Thank you. Can I ask a short, <coughs> short question? Like, as an editor, yeah. uh, what was the longest time of revision that you ended up seeing from an initial paper onto the publication? Because sometimes some papers need to be revised and, or rewritten, not just revised, like rewrite, rewrite, and sometimes get engaged. Like, uh, uh, do you have any memorable experience about that? So, at Language, the journal that I was the editor of, um, we instituted a policy that we said, you know, we kind of allow one round of major revisions and one or two rounds of minor revisions. So, if a paper at the beginning looks like it will need multiple rounds of major revisions, we would do a desk reject. Or if an author revised the paper and, you know, the new version that comes back is better but still needs a lot of work, we will decline the paper at that stage. So we kind of, in that way, limited the total time because we kind of allow one major set of revisions and say two minor revision sets. And the reason we did that was at that journal, which you know publishes 20 to 25 papers a year, there was such a large backlog of papers that were accepted already 
that were waiting sometimes a year or two years to get into print, that we had to accept fewer papers just because the pipeline was so full. Um, some journals don't have a, a set number of pages they can publish a year. Right now, whereas many journals are fully online, and that means they don't have page limits. They can publish as many papers as they accept. And in those journals, you often, they often allow multiple rounds of revisions because they don't really care how many papers they accept. Um, so a long answer to say, at language, I, I think, you know, 18 months, 18 to 24 months was the typical from submission to publication for papers that eventually made it into publication. There are some outliers that took a lot longer. Why might it take longer? Um, long papers are more difficult to find reviewers for, and reviewers take longer to write reports on long papers. So if your paper is very long, it's going to spend twice as much time in the editorial process. It's also long meaning how long? How many words, how many pages? It's also fewer people will probably read it, so it's generally better to write shorter papers. It might also spend longer in the process because the author might take not four months to make the revisions, but might take a year to make the revisions. And it might spend longer in the process, you know, for various unforeseen reasons like COVID, or somebody had a baby, or, you know, somebody's colleague went on parental leave and all of a sudden that person had to teach twice as much as a reviewer or an editor or an author and, and all of those things can add to the time but all journals try to make the time as short as possible actually the second part of the question was like rewriting not the revision process like so that's rejected and you see the potential of the paper and like can you please rewrite it and Maybe the second round was okay, there was potential, but like, not really there yet. Uh, do you have any? Yeah. So, in all the years that I was editor, um, you know, I, I issued more such decisions that we called kind of, and we leave the door open. We declined this paper, but we leave the door open to resubmit it. I did more of that when I started than when I ended, because um, often, even when authors resubmitted or submitted it anew, it still had many of the same problems. People find it really, really difficult to reconceptualize the paper rather than revise a paper. Um, but there were a few examples of people really kind of going back to the drawing board and taking on board the feedback that we provided them. And often that took longer because often that meant like go back to the drawing board and go and rethink this paper. Um, but I, you know, I can't tell you whether that was two years or. Yeah. But yeah, it, it can take a long time. Even even you know when you get a mostly positive revise and resubmit decision. As I say, that revisions might take you two to four months to do. So if you get a rewrite the paper rather than revise it, it's probably going to take you a year plus to, to rethink it. So, in total, three to four years in the longest time? Yeah, I think if a paper, if it takes three or four years for a paper to be published, then there's something wrong in the editorial process. That's too long, but that does happen as outlier cases. But that is really too long. Because by, if you submit a paper and it takes four years to reach publication, by that time it's out of date. Yeah. Right? So then it's just no longer relevant. So it shouldn't take that long, but sometimes it does. So two years to maximum? Two years. Two years from submission until it appears in print in linguistics is not uncommon. In some subfields, the time is much faster. So in, in especially experimental psychology, it's often very fast. Because those papers are often very short. Right. Or in physics, it's often very fast because those papers are often very short. So it, it differs from field to field in linguistics and many social sciences from submission until in print 18, 18 to 24 months is typical.
So uh, why don't we finish the official part of the uh, uh, session now? Let's uh, uh, thank uh, Professor Kutsi. Thank you. Thank you. And those who still have questions or want to have some individual cases and discuss with uh, Professor Kutsi, please, please remain. Yeah. We will be here and uh, we will, uh, yeah, we can ask all the questions. I took some photos for reporting purpose. They will not go on any SNS uh, or social network services. They will be only strictly for this event uh, reporting. So, yeah. If you have really still concern, like just email me and like uh, show me the picture. I, I don't want to be seen. Then I will erase uh, the face. Yeah. So we had a question over here. Right. <laughs> yeah. We talk about